One of the other problems of uh, politics is that there must always be problems and solutions. It was once said of a liberal politician, he has more solutions than there are problems. Let me give you an example of how problems can be created statistically and otherwise. One of the, uh, the Congressional Budget Office came out with some statistics a few years ago showing that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer or were during the Reagan administration, presumably not in this new enlightened era. Now, wh wh again, being skeptical, I sent away for the original uh, statistics. It, it really produces absolute cynicism when you read enough of these uh, government reports. Uh, one of the ways that the poor were getting poorer was that they left out of these statistics more than $150 billion in government transfers. Uh, those weren't counted. And as for the rich, they counted as capital gains things that most people would not think of as capital gains. For example, if you invest $10,000 and you hold the investment while the price level doubles uh, and then you cash it in. Now, if you get less than $20,000, you have lost money in real terms. Not as far as the government's concerned. Let's suppose you get 15000 back with the price level doubled. As far as the Congressional Budget Office is concerned, you've made $5,000 in capital gains. And if, and if you want, want to correct for inflation, you divide the $5,000 by two, and so you've made $2,500 in capital gains. So you can be one of the rich who's getting richer all the while you're heading toward bankruptcy court. <laughs> and this, this, this produced what I think is one of the fundamental principles of statistics, which is that A always exceeds B if you leave out enough of A and exaggerate B. One of, one, of, one of the reasons that the uh, people in the upper income bracket receive such a high percentage of the total national income is that there are more people. That is, if you took a look at the top 20% of families and income and look at the bottom 20%, you'll discover that there are 28% more people at the top in the top 20% than in the bottom 20%. And since it is people who earn money, this is one of the reasons the others are in the top brackets. There have been a number of studies done well, there's, there's a more fundamental problem with the data than this. Years ago, someone uh, uh, told about a, uh, a man in New York who had heard that someone was hit by a car in Manhattan uh, once every 20 minutes. And his response was, he must get awfully tired of that. <laughs> exactly the same reasoning can be found in these statistics that are given out, because they assume that these are the same people all the time. Uh, there have been several studies done, and fortunately, they've been done by people who are left-wing intellectuals at the University of Michigan and conservative Republicans in Washington, and they all give the same answer, which is that in the course of less than a decade, most Americans move out of whatever income bracket they're in. For example, if you looked at the um, bottom 20% as of 1979 of income taxpayers. By 1988, 85% of those people were no longer in the bottom. In fact, a slightly higher percentage were in the top 20% by 1988 than remained in the bottom 20%. And so we're talking about a changing mixture of people over time rather than the same folks. In fact, many of the people in the bottom 20% are the children of the people in the top 20%. And finally, let, let me look at another uh, crisis that we hear of, uh, hunger statistics. Now, a political advocacy group computed a few years ago how many Americans were hungry. Now, when you think about it, how would you find out how many people are hungry? It takes a long time to go through a country of 240 million people and ask everybody, are you hungry? <laughs> Naturally, they had to speed this up. <laughs> so they got a census computer tape. And they figured out the eligibility for food stamps, and they ran the tape through to find out how many people are eligible for food stamps. Then they found out how many people actually get food stamps. They subtracted one from the other, and the difference were hungry.
Using this method, someone decided to find out what was the hungriest county in the United States. It turned out to be a farming and ranching community <laughs> where the employees and the employers ate what they grew. Now, because the employees were being paid partly in room and board, their cash payments were lower than they would have been otherwise. And so in the county, there were a certain number of people who were uh, below the level where they were eligible for food, even though they were eating their own steaks and, and vegetables. And only, I, think, I think there was only one person in the entire county who actually was on food stamps. All the others were hungry. <laughs> there, there are more of these things, but I, I'm going to cut, cut it short to have some time for questions and answers. Uh, one of the, with hunger as with income, when you look at actual individual flesh and blood people, you get a radically different answer than if you look at the, st at the gross statistics. So the Center for Disease Control uh, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture have actually looked at flesh and blood people. They have taken blood samples. They've done other studies of them. They cannot find any greater likelihood of poor children being clinically underweight than other children. Blood samples show no evidence of any protein or vitamin deficiencies varying from one income bracket to another. The only difference they can find is that low-income women have a slightly greater tendency to be obese, presumably from hunger. <laughs> the, the, the media play a tremendous role in all this. Because you can always find someone who is highly atypical, put him on the tube, interview him, and represent his case as if it's typical of the whole country. And there's a great deal of that going on. There are not only ideological reasons for doing this, there are financial reasons. Because obviously the more crises there are, the more reason there is to buy newspapers and watch television. And so you find many, many crises in these places. Now, I've suggested a couple of times and like most suggestions by economists, it was ignored, that uh, the networks could easily afford to have a department of st professional statisticians who would examine all these hysterical statistics that are thrown around by various groups that would have uh, an ax to grind. Of course, that would mean there'd be more accuracy on, 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 the, on the television tube, but it also means there'd be lower ratings. And so this is apparently not the kind of trade-off that they're looking for. Thank you very much.